Uh, thank you for joining us. Hello. Um, so int to introduce myself, uh, my name is Fiona Broom. Um, I am the deputy editor for Features uh, here at SciDevNet. Today we're discussing the state of cancer care in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, cancer deaths are set to nearly double in sub-Saharan Africa and could rise to 1 million deaths per year by 2030. This is according to some new research that was published by the Lancet Oncology Commission in May. Um, the commission provided an in-depth review of the state of cancer care in the region. Um, it found that childhood cancer prevalence now stands at 56.3 cases per million, and under current projections, half of the global childhood cancers in 2050 will occur in Africa. Um, the researchers also found that one in seven women are at risk of developing cancer by the age of 75. <clears throat> excuse me, with, with cervical cancer and breast cancer, the leading causes of cancer deaths. For those of you who don't know, SciDevNet launched uh, the Africa Science Focus podcast and radio show in August of 2020. It's a weekly 15 minute show about African science, African science and African research um, and how it's being applied in African communities. And the podcast is available online through all of your podcast platforms, um, but it's also broadcast for free to communities across the region via our radio station partners. Uh, so the Lancet Oncology Commission painted a picture of urgency. They warned that without rapid interventions, cancer rates could double by 2040 to more than 1.4 million cases a year. Uh, so our Africa Science Focus team decided to produce a dedicated three-part mini-series to dig into the findings of the commission and to look further into the challenges and the developments in cancer care on the continent. Um, today we're joined by some of the cancer specialists who featured in the podcast series. Um, Beatrice Riafe Adai, she's the head of the Peace and Love Hospitals of Ghana um, and a breast cancer specialist and Dr Riafe is also a lead author of the Lancet Oncology Commission on Cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Tola Lupe Falowo, uh, she's the founder and director of the cancer intervention charity Cancer Aware Nigeria. And Kemisola Botarinwa is the founder of Nextware Technology and the creator of a cancer detecting smart bra. We are also joined by the new Africa Science Focus editor, Pokechi Akionyawu. Um, and our reporter in Kenya, Michael Koloki. Good to have you with us, Michael. Um, and yes, our Sub-Saharan Africa French edition editor, Julian Shangwang is with us. Um, and our Middle East and North Africa editor, Bofaina Osama is joining us from Cairo. So, uh, Tolupe, let's begin with you. Um, could you just give us uh, something of an overview of the state of um, cancer care in Nigeria um, and the accessibility uh, and some of those issues that go around and um, um, some of the work that you're doing in your organization. Thank you, Fiona. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on this platform. My name is Tolu Lope Falowo. I'm the founder and executive director of Cancer Aware Nigeria. We are a Lagos-based cancer intervention charity with a focus on breast and gynecological cancers. Um, I always get asked the question, why breast and gynecological cancers? Well, for one, Breast is the number one cancer in Nigeria, both in terms of incidence and mortality, um, followed closely by cervical cancer at number three in terms of incidence and number two in terms of fatality. We have a rising cancer incidence. Obviously the Lancet uh, report highlighted this, but there is an urgent need for our ministries of health, our governments to take drastic action. For us who are on the field, who are in the communities, we see firsthand the suffering, the what lack of access is causing for our people, especially in the disadvantaged and low income communities of Nigeria. Um, for example, one of the work that our organization has been championing for the last four years is for the government of our country to introduce the HPV vaccine into the routine immunization schedule. It would interest you to know that as, as at 2022, at least 25 other African countries have introduced this into their routine immunization schedule. But Nigeria 
which is the giant of Africa, and who has a high burden of cervical cancer is yet to do this. So we have an advocacy campaign. We have an online petition on change.org that has almost gathered 50,000 signatures, um, urging the government as a matter of urgency to get this vaccine into the routine immunization schedule so eligible girls can access it for free. Right now to access the vaccine, you, you must pay out of pocket for it. And it is quite, um, it is out of reach for many families. Um, one of the driving facts, so for example, breast cancer cases that we see in our hospitals, they come in in advanced stages. We're seeing 50, 60% of women coming in with stage three, stage four disease, where in most cases, it's only palliative care we can offer for stage four disease. And why are we seeing this late stage presentation? They're a combination of factors. And number one on the list is socioeconomic factors. Poverty is a driving factor for women coming in late with breast cancer um, in this case. When we interview some of these women that we support through some of our programs, we find out that the fact that they have to pay out of pocket for mammograms, they have to pay for biopsies out of pocket is a major reason why they don't go to the hospital early, why they don't present early. And it now leads to them coming in with late disease and leads to the high numbers of fatalities we're seeing. Um, I must say that the numbers coming out of Nigeria now um, in terms of mortality, for example, for breast cancer, will tell you that oh, a certain number of women, thousands of women die every year. But I can tell you that the numbers are grossly understated. And how do we know this? Because, for example, inaccurate ca um, cancer data registry um, is one of the reasons. Some of these women, especially those in rural areas, do not even make it to the hospitals. The fact that treatment facilities are far from where they live, they have to um, enter transport, they have to travel long distances to access screening, to access treatment. So they'll rather say, oh, okay, I will try uh, traditional medicine or I will just hope it goes away. You know, so um, socioeconomic factors, in my own opinion, are um, the main reason why we are seeing this dismal statistics in cancer cases and um, fatalities. Um, what our organization is doing about it, we started Cancer Aware eight years ago, uh, primarily as a cancer information service we realized that there was not a lot of information around where people could access screening in Nigeria, where they could go for, uh, for mammograms. It, it was just unavailable. And it was from my own personal experience. Um, I had gone to the UK for my master's degree. And as a student, I was routinely invited for a pap smear. This was in 2009. Up until then, I'd never heard of a pap smear. I didn't know I needed one and I was in my 20s. And um, you know, I I eventually went for the for the test, and you know, the nurse was so um, accommodating. She explained the procedure to me why it was necessary, and um, they phoned in my results a couple of weeks later. Fast forward uh, to three years later, when I moved back home, I wanted to do another pap smear as I was due for one, and I could not find a center to do it. I looked online. I couldn't find anything, you know, it took a, a bit of digging for me to find somewhere that would offer me not even a pap smear, but um, a visual inspection with acetic acid, which is a lower form of cervical screening. And that made me think, oh, if I, with all my um, information, knowledge, access, could not find a screening center at the, um, the uh, tip of my fingers, what about people who don't have the access, who live in the villages? And you know what started as an information portal quickly morphed into a full-fledged charity. And over the years, we have evolved. We've included screening, we've included treatment support and advocacy into our programs. So there is still a lot to be done in the space. We need the government to take the lead on cancer care in, in the region, in Sub-Saharan Africa. The governments of the respective countries need to take the lead and they need to support the organizations who are already working in the community so we can reduce this dismal statistics that is coming out of the region. Thank you very much. Thanks, Salu. Um, 
you mentioned the out-of-pocket cost for some of the screening options uh, and that traditional medicine, um, it, when the costs are high for uh, hospital-based care, um, people turn to traditional medicine. What are right. we talking about in terms of charges? Uh, sorry, out-of-pocket costs. What's uh, and what's the sort of difference in price between um, uh, care at a health center and um, what you might pay for um, traditional medicine? Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. So, um, first and foremost, the fact that people cannot access, have to pay out of pocket, is a problem which we've already identified. But even the fact that they have to pay out of pocket, most cannot afford it. Even the basic test. We must bear in mind that the, the majority of the population live in poverty. They live be, below the, uh, the global standard of what is acceptable standard of living. So for example, let's take a mammogram. A mammogram in the city of Lagos would cost between uh, maybe about $20 or $30 for a, for a mammogram. That is out of reach of many people. Now talking about treatment, chemotherapy, you, you, a person who has cancer will probably will require several courses over a period of time. They will probably require surgery. They will require radiotherapy. They may require radiotherapy. So it's already running into tens of thousands of dollars. So it is, it's not even negotiable that for some people that is a no-brainer. They, they can't even afford it. So they just look for an alternative. So for the traditional medicine, I do not have the charges or their numbers offhand, but from anecdotal um, information from patients that we've seen over the years, it is way, 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 way less than what is charged for conventional treatment. And this is what makes it attractive um, to them because they say, oh, come, I can treat you and you don't have to pay um, for that much money. And then they talk about the, the toxicity of, for example, chemotherapy. You know, so that's also another problem. They say, oh, no problem, just come. You don't need to have surgery. You don't need to cut off the breast using breast cancer as an example. You don't need to take chemotherapy. We have this traditional alternatives. And sometimes it's even things like supplements, unproven supplements that they, they sell, you know, and, um, and people choose it because it is cheaper. And then because it is, they feel it is um, less toxic or less invasive than conventional treatment. Thank you. Um, Kemi, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, your smart bra um, and how uh, this innovation is um, attempting to bridge uh, the cost gap. Um, good morning from Nigeria. My name is Bolari Wakemi Sola. Um, I'm the founder and the CEO of Nestwet Technologies. Um, I'm not into medical, anything medical. I'm a tech woman, I'm a robotics engineer. Um, what how brought about, I think I should just call, I should talk about what brought about the idea of a smart bra. Um, like um, Tom Lopez said, in Nigeria, yeah, the, the um, death rate, mortality rate is high among um, the witness. I lost a hand to breast cancer in 2017. And um, before she lost the battle to breast cancer, I do visit her on the teaching hospital here in Nigeria, one of the teaching hospitals we have in Nigeria. So I met several women, you know, of, of age categories, even teenagers were there. So that actually amazed me like, oh, teenager having breast cancer, so I have to walk to um, no, walk up to one of the oncologists treating her bed. And I asked about this because I see it as a threat then. Oh, this one is a threat to me. I begin to imagine me having this cancer. So um, it said that, well, if you're able to detect at early stage, we had a lot of discussion, but the key word I, I held on to is, if you're able to detect at early stage, you can be cured. In even nine out of 10 cases can get cured. And you know, the, the problem here in Nigeria, most of the cases we have have already grown to the to the advanced stage, you know, stage three upward. My sister was stage three and she later died of stage four. So uh, that brought the idea of the smart bra. And when I went into a research on um, breast cancer, on the care, on the prevention, on the detection, um, I see that early detection is the best way 
we can actually tackle this cancer because if you can be able to detect it early enough, then you have the possibility of getting cured. So that brought about the, the smart rat device. And before I could like um, pick a, a technology for the development, I have to wage it and wage it um, into the existing technology we have for breast screening. I look inward into the ultrasound and mammogram. And I was like, oh, mammogram, fine. It's, it's the effective one. Though it's, it's difficult for mammogram to diagnose women with dense breast, but it's, it's the common one that they use all over the world for breast screening. And I see that they still use radiation. And your doctor will tell you, there's a woman that will tell them once in three years, you can only have the mammogram once in three years because of the radiation. Though it's a little bit of X-ray, but at the same time, it's dangerous for body tissue. So I want, oh, that will not be nice because we want the stain to be, we want women to be checking their status on daily basis. So subjecting women to radiation is, is not a good option. So that made me look inward into ultrasound technology. So we actually use um, transducer sensors to replace the ultrasound. So basically the smart guy uses ultrasound for its diagnosis and we invite um, artificial intelligence for the fact that we are not using images. We are only using the parameters that um, is generated from, from the breast. So that is what the, the smart guy does. And I would also like to talk on, on the, the, the stage, though so long we have talked talk a lot about the, the stage of um, breast cancer in Nigeria or, or in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, aside being late detection, there's this thing of awareness which I want to talk about. If you are tackling a breast cancer, I mean, cancer generally, the first thing to look inward into is awareness. Our people are on her way of this diseases. Either breast cancer, either cervix, um, pelvic cancer, whatever cancer, they are not aware. They are not informed. They don't have the proper information about this. And that has caused a lot of problems. The statistics we have, to look, I will tell you that, the statistics we have right now is not the real statistics. It's not the real people. It's not the real number of uh, breast cancer patients that we have. They are more than that. But because of this mentality, because of the fact that they're not aware of this thing, most people, they get it, they ignore it, they take it as a spiritual attack. You know, we are kind of, you know, we're kind of um, religious here in the part of the world. So we are attached it to spiritual attack. So this made it grow to stage three, stage four, you know, to advanced stages. So I will want to talk more on this awareness thing. Find prevention, cure, um, um, early diagnosis, fine. But the major bedrock is the awareness, which is the awareness. Our people, our women, are not aware of the disease at all. Fine, we have breast cancer advocacy coming every year. We advocate for it. But all this advocacy are done in the major cities. I can remember this year, I think this year, I joined the advocacy for cancer. Um, yes, that was the way um, the, for the um, Cancer Awareness Day. And someone walked up to me when we were moving around the city of Abuja. And the person asked me, oh, this thing that you're doing, is they going to the, um, the grassroots, I mean, the core Nigerians, are they aware of this? And I said to myself, this is a big question. We only do this in Lagos, in big cities in Abuja for Takot. The people that really need to hear this, um, 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 this, um, information and not hearing it. And those are the people at the grassroots. Those are the people that doesn't have any access to the internet. Those are the people that doesn't have access to um, a smartphone or whatever uh, a smart. So that's the one that really need this advocacy. And it has to do with a government. So look, I've said it, a government, they're not doing uh, uh, anyway. That's fine. But I think they should be the one to take the lead. Why people like us will follow. So, um, the, the major problem to me has been on the awareness. Awareness. We need to do more on awareness creation. Fine. We are coming over to diagnosing um, device that can help women check, the, you know, diagnose themselves easily, you know, on the com in the comfort of their own without going for mammogram, exposing themselves to X-ray or um, yeah, to mammogram. So, but it's still bottom to awareness. If we have those device. Um, done and we have it everywhere. If people are not aware of the disease, the device is as good as nothing. 
fine, we have the device completed, we have the, um, um, the, the prevention, we have the um, healthcare services, you know, coming up and all that. If people are not even aware of what we're talking about, then it's as good, whatever technology we have is as good as nothing. So um, what I'm going to say is all about, you no, know, it's all about awareness. And it's part of what I have also incorporated in what I'm doing. Fine, I'm not into medical, I'm into tech, but at the same time, I think people need to know about it. We need to pass the information across to the women in the grass, the women that live below five dollars. The difference that we're doing fine, it's it's um we are um, ch tackling the challenge of mammogram. Toloka said the mammogram is a big eye and it's not even easily accessible. You can only assess mammogram or any breast screening technique in the big cities. The people at the grassroots doesn't even have all this, um, um, all this advantage. So the accessibility of this um, um, te technique is also another challenge on its own, aside the awareness. Find the aware, okay, what can we use to check ourselves? As I speak, there is no breast screening, um, national breast screening um, um, program in Nigeria. I'm sorry. I have to be sincere and I have to be no blood. So all these are what, you know, are what actually um, um, mounted up to what we are having right now. And like I said, the, 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 the statistics is more higher than what we have, than what we have on the record. It's more, more high. It's more, more high than that. You see people going to Trotters Mountain for deliverance. They are having this kind of thought. It's a spiritual attack. So we need to do more about awareness. And that's what I'm going to say. Uh, and that's what um, we, part of what uh, my company is doing, aside coming up with the diagnosis device, we are also coming up with awareness. We need to create awareness for women to know about this cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Kemi. Um, some really interesting and important points that you raised there. Um, I'll get you. Uh, you were the editor on this um, podcast mini series that we produced. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about why uh, you thought that it was worth dedicating three full episodes um, to this issue where we would often ordinarily uh, just produce a single episode um, on an issue? And could you also talk to us a little bit about how cancer is covered generally by the media? Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, Kemi and Tolu both there raising the issues uh, around awareness and sort of public information and education. Hi, Fiona. I was just asking if you want to meet me. Yes. Um, I mean, the reason that we dedicated three episodes to Cancer Report was it was the sense of urgency that we felt once we once we received the land, once we saw the Lancet report. The cancer burden in sub-Saharan Africa is constantly rising. And that report said in 2020 alone, there, were, uh, there was an estimated eight, 801,392 cases and over half a million cancer deaths in the region alone. Um, and the re report highlighted several um, issues with treatment and management of cancer in the region, including shortage of medical workers in oncology. We talked about the factors hindering cancer treatment, people seeking alternative and traditional methods. We talked about um, the high rate of breast and cervical cancer and mortality rates as well, childhood cancers, prostate cancers. And it did seem like that report had too many issues packed. And we thought that addressing it as just a single podcast or just a single report will not do justice to our coverage um, inside them, but also um, on Africa size focus. And so we decided that we would um, take the route of the mini series and that's why we had the three part mini series. Um, each part was dedicated to what we felt would add our voices to the advocacy against Cancer, rising cases, rising cases of cancer in the region, and every individual that we invited, every expert that we invited, tackled these issues with the depth that we expected. And we're hoping that with our contribution, um, we would basically add our voices to 
well, we will get impact and reduce the, at the, in the, to the barest, to reduce the number of cases, cancer cases in the region. We had about the uh, high case, high number of cases of breast and cervical cancer. Um, we had about prostate cancer, childhood cancers, all of these issues. It did seem like we needed to treat them distinctly. And um, so that's why we decided to go the route of um, the mini series. Thanks. And how is cancer, uh, how is cancer news um, sort of taken on by uh, mainstream media in sub-Saharan Africa? Because it, does it get a lot of coverage? Um, is the coverage informative and in depth? Um, and are there, there are certain kinds of cancers that get more attention than others? Yes, so I, I do think that there's a lot more that needs to be done with cancer coverage in the region. And a lot more, we need more reports, we need more informed reports, we need more knowledgeable reports. I'm not sure that's happening enough. We do have spurts of, of reports that are detailed and contain the information that we need, but I don't think that much is being done in that regard and that we need to step up our game as, as journalists to first of all um, provide the public with the knowledge that they, they need to, empowering knowledge, first of all. Um, with the mandate of the Lancet Cancer Report, we, we see that the burden is, is rather, it, it's a lot, and that we must start to uh, increase cancer reportage in, in this part. Um, so right now, what I think is, is obtainable in the media or what we can find as a sensationalized report, sometimes inaccurate report, reporting. And these may, this can give um, rise to false hopes or expectations. Um, so, so part of the solution will be to also understand the disease. A lot of the times we see that cancer is grouped as one and, and then there are several forms of cancer. We also need to, to reflect that in our reports more. Uh, reports on the different kinds of cancer that uh, that exist, um, and reports with more nuances and 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 with a bit more understanding of the disease itself. Um, we do need to see a, lo a lot more targeted reports on the various cancers. I said that uh, I, I mean, there's no overemphasizing that we need to talk about the mortality rates. We also need solution journalism in this regard. We need to center the voices of, science, of the scientists and the experts who work in this um, sector, or in this field, so that we, we, we can hear from them um, what the, the, the updates, the trends, and we can hear from them what we need to do to reduce the number of cases of cancer in the sub in the in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so like uh, the, the one instance that I would give on solution journalism would be the report on smart bra. Um, that was really good. It did give us some impact as well. Um, so we do need more solution journalism on cancer reporting um, in sub-Saharan Africa. We also need a barren narratives as well. Um, so one of the problems that we noticed that we observed in our reporting of in our in our mini series was that as the help help health seeking behavior of women, for instance, who would often sometimes um, look wait for their spouses to give them to, to take care of their health, take care of their bodies. So we do need empowering narratives. We need to hear the voices of cancer survivors. We need to destigmatize the reporting uh, cancer in the reporting that we do. Um, yes, yeah, so there's some of the things that we can do to better report cancer in the region. Thanks again, Chief. Um Michael, you were our reporter on this mini-series. Um, probably what a lot of people don't know about how uh, podcasts and news are produced is that there's a lot more work that goes on behind the scenes than what ends up um, making it onto the front page or making it into the episodes themselves. Um, so we produce three 15-minute episodes. That's 45 minutes of content, but you yourself did hours of um, interviews for this series. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering what is it that we weren't 
able to include in the final episodes? What are some other issues that really stood out to you that we should also be talking about? I think one of the issues perhaps we didn't touch on is taking the journey with a cancer patient, finding out from them the first-hand experience of what they are going through. Because we're sort of uh, have been looking at it from the other side of the lens. And perhaps in this particular situation, not having had that opportunity to speak to a patient through what their journey is like. And this may also be because of a couple of reasons, I would say. One of them is that from my experience in trying to reach out to cancer patients is that not many are willing to speak out. And this is partially because of stigma associated with it, as we had earlier on, and also because some of them really are not too aware of, of what they should say in terms of what they're going through. And this is also because of perhaps lack of awareness. And they are going through this uh, uh, period where they have this disease, but really they're not, they're not sure of you know, what is next in store for them. And I think that is one perspective that perhaps uh, we did not have in this particular piece. And also, it, it, you know, it would take quite a bit of, of time and maybe several episodes to truly walk through that journey with a patient. And just to touch on something that will do of awareness. And this is an issue I think that really is, is a big issue and could also possibly cover a whole episode on itself. This I feel is perhaps one of the biggest challenges. And if you'll allow me to give an anecdotal example, is that in my home village, not many people are aware of what cancer is. If you speak of malaria, for example, people are aware of that, they know what it is, but if you mention cancer, people are not aware about it. And the other challenges that we spoke about in these episodes, and one of them, for example, is people resorting to go and see traditional healers. Because in the village there, if you don't know what you're going through, the closest person who might be able to tell you what you're going through is the traditional healer. And you will go and visit them, and they will not perhaps ask you for money as you, you would be asked for in a modern hospital. They might say, well, you could bring a couple of your chickens and that will suffice. And then at that stage, when you meet the traditional healer, you might end up with the wrong information. And because of lack of awareness, the person there in the village is not really aware that they're getting the wrong information. And they do not end up going, they don't end up going to the hospital and end up just suffering in silence at home. And one area of suffering in silence at home, and this I have witnessed, is once again back to stigma. And I think uh, in this regard, one area of stigma I would say is uh, the area of men talking about it. I, I think basically perhaps uh, Tolu and Kemisola might agree with me. I think this is widespread across Sub-Saharan Africa, is the fact that women generally will talk about health issues that they're going through together and sort of come up with a solution. Do you need to go and see a doctor? Where would you go to see a doctor? But in the case of men, they keep quiet. And this I have witnessed um, with two people who are close to me. One was uh, my late uncle and one was my father. And sort of both of them went through situations where um, they may or may not have had cancer. And I say may or may not have had, for example, because I'll just give a very personal experience in the case of my father. Um, at the moment, he's going through treatment, but it is something that he has really withheld information. My mother would know about it because when you talk to him, he will not reveal it. And this I understand because my late uncle as well, he did not want to seek medical treatment because there was this general feeling in, in my community that as a man, you do not 
uh, talk about issues related to disease, especially diseases that people are not aware about, such as cancer. So this has been a big issue, and I think this ties in with the whole issue of awareness and perhaps uh, in regards to government authorities coming in and educating people. In the big cities, there's information, there's internet, there's no uh, media uh, coverage in regards to social media, for example, in regards to television, for example, radio reaches out there. And that is one area I would say whereby a podcast such as ours, Africa Science Focus, is able to reach to the people out there in the village and inform them. And I think through these discussions, I would say, is where I would say I'm optimistic that people out there in the village will have awareness through our podcast and other people who will be talking about these conditions that will hopefully help the people out there. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. So we, we just have about 15 minutes left. Um, some really important issues that were raised there, and I think particularly around um, awareness and public education and public knowledge. Um, I'd like to sort of open it up to Tolu and um, Kemi and perhaps some of our other editors, Bosana and Julian, um, uh, if you've got any thoughts about what what role the media like SciDevNet, but also the mainstream media across the region, what role uh, they can play in um, public education or if, or if there are some other avenues uh, that also need exploration uh, in terms of, of educating the public um, and uh, creating more knowledge around public health. Um, would anybody like to, to kick off? Thank you, Fiona. Great conversations and contributions. Um, I feel the media, especially the mainstream media, can do a lot more in terms of um, awareness, but not just awareness. Awareness is important. It's the first step. It's the, if you call it the foundation that we build on. But then after awareness, what next? We have to consider screening. We have to consider treatment, access, and things like that. But the role of the media, especially the mainstream media, is so crucial not only in creating awareness, but in also holding the relevant stakeholders, i.e. the governments of the respective countries accountable. Because the reality is that um, we can't do this alone. And by we, I mean um, NGOs, charities, civil societies, um, advocates. We need the respective uh, governments and ministries of health to take the, to lead the, um, the movement. For example, uh, universal health care coverage, you know, many, were, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa were signatories to the Abuja Accord, whereby they said, oh, a certain percentage of their um, revenue would go into health care. How many people, how many of them have fulfilled that, um, um, that commitment? So the, the media has a huge role to play. What we see um, in Nigeria for the most part is the media running um, um, coverage on cancer when it's a particular time of the year. So for example, October is, is, a, is, a, is a main culprit, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And everybody's writing about pink and things like that. Please don't get me wrong, it is very important and it, it definitely helps, but we need the conversation to be going on all year round. Why? Because cancer happens every year. Thanks, Tolu. Thank you. Uh, do, does anybody else have a comment or a question? Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Sean uh, Julien. I'm the editor of the French edition of SciDev.net. Uh, so my um, contribution here would be to say that what I think uh, mainstream media should do would be to, to reinforce the sensitization by, um, by, um, by making sure that they are uh, present on the, all, the all the platforms where uh, fake news are being 
um, uh, distributed. It means uh, social media, uh, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and so on and so forth. And make sure that they are present, very present on this um, on this uh, platform to make sure that they are the good good information is being given to to populations. Um, after saying that, I would just like to share the, the situation uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, French in particular, where uh, one of the main uh, issues regarding the fight against uh, cancer is, uh, and, uh, and in particular, the cervical cancer, is uh, the fact that uh, in our region, many people um, uh, have no confidence in the, in the vaccines against cervical cancer. For example, in Cameroon, uh, two years ago, in 2020, government, uh, the government launched uh, a, campaign, a vaccination campaign again, uh, against this disease, and uh, the vaccination campaign was uh, targeting uh, young girls, but uh, many parents, many parents uh, refused to submit their girls, their lead, their doctors to this campaign, saying that um, this uh, vaccine is likely to uh, avoid, uh, to prevent, to prevent this girl to be able to give birth to baby later in their life. So this is an idea. Uh, and in Cameroon, for in Cameroon, for example, the, the, there was a, a member of the civil society who sent a message to the president of the republic uh, to invite him to to uh, prevent uh, to, to to refuse to refuse the this vaccination campaign saying that this vaccine is not good. So uh, this is to say that um, there are there are a lot of um, a lot of fake news circulating in our in our society and uh, social media are the platform where these fake news are uh, taking a lot of importance. So uh, mainstream media should make sure that uh, they are present on this uh, platform to avoid not to let uh, fake news taking more and more importance there. So this is what I wanted to share. Thank you, Shalian. Does anybody else have comments or questions? Yes, Bernard. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, good to see you. Thank you so much for a great uh, program. I think with how the um, uh, media, I mean, social media, just as a follow-up to what the, uh, the previous speaker just mentioned, Perhaps if there is a way also to use uh, uh, I mean for the mainstream media to meet social media. So in this case, like uh, a podcast on radio, I mean, like which can be on radio, for example, may as well be able to be uh, used on WhatsApp so people can get educated on it because people are using uh, social media to spread a lot of misinformation, but if there's a way that some of our public health approaches can also be uh, disseminated through uh, social media. So it's something that perhaps we could, we could uh, consider. And then also with the issue of, you know, like, uh, you know, rural areas, languages and things like that. So I know, for example, in, in, in Africa, you know, radio, they say is the king because about 60% of the population tend to get information a lot through the radio. So um, much as we plan also to consider using the radio, I think some of the outcomes could also be, uh, maybe we should consider looking it into how we can use social media to spread this kind of information. Thanks. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Jackie, you've got your hand up. Okay. So I, I was I was going to say that um, maybe NGOs like um, Tulu Lope and um, Kemi and other charities should think about working with health workers that do return immunization. You know what they do is that they identify, you know, community volunteers in different communities, and they 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 get information through them to 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 know the 
children that had, had had zero dose immunization and any other illness that requires attention. So for those people that have cancer and, and all that, they still do it and they are referred. So maybe you can think about, you know, working with health workers that are already doing that so that you can fish out these women that already have cancer and don't know what, what to do about it. Because there are quite a number of them that really want to get help, but, you know, they don't have information and they don't know what to do. But I think that people like health workers that do routine immunization, they've been able to close that gap of identifying zero dose children, for example, that have never taken immunization. So maybe if we strategically do that, it could be very helpful for identifying these women that need help with, especially early detection of cancer. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, does anybody have a response to Jackie or... Um... Any additional comments or questions? Okay, thank you so much, Jackie, for that suggestion. It's a brilliant idea. And I just wanted to say that um, Cancer Aware Nigeria presently has a grant proposal that we, with the, we're hoping to get some funding for later this year, whereby we want to train frontline healthcare workers, specifically um, nurses, and community health workers whom we call choose um, across the region, we want to educate them, we want to train them on identifying the early warning signs of breast cancer. And then we will set up a referral system whereby they are promptly referred to a secondary hospital in, the, in their community, in the area. So we, we're going to be piloting that in um, Oyo State and Lagos State. Um, we, we plan to train about 800 um, nurses and choose um, for, for that particular program. So um, it's, it's actually a great suggestion because like you rightly said, these community healthcare workers serve as a bridge between the people in the community and the, for in this case, the primary healthcare centers. So they are a great resource and it's been trialed in several countries, I believe um, was done in Rwanda, whereby, and they, they recorded uh, quite a, a huge success in that regard. And we'll also use that to set up some breast clinics in um, specific communities. So thank you, thank you for the suggestion. Thank you, Tolu. Anybody else with comments or questions? No? Okay. Well, I think my clock is a little bit fast. I think we've still got a couple of minutes left, but if there's no further comments or questions, um, perhaps, Ruth, would you uh, like to say anything uh, further about the readers' conference calls? I think um, the next one will be coming up in four weeks, I guess. Uh, yes, so um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is a monthly event um, that we run to try and um, give our readers the opportunity to speak to um, all our regional editors and um, and the and invited guests, um, experts in various fields um, that we're fortunate enough to count among our network at SciDev.net. We'll be setting the agenda for the next call um, in the coming week or so um, and details of that will be sent out shortly um, but yes it's the same Tuesday and the same time um, every month so uh, four weeks today will be will be the next one and um, uh, if you are not on our mailing list and would like to be um, please do get in touch um, you could email myself ruth.douglas at sidev.net. Thanks Ruth. Okay. Uh, so if there's no further um, comments or queries uh, we can finish up here. Thank you everybody for joining us um, and thank you to everybody uh, who was our guests. Um, it was a really uh, important conversation I think um, with some really excellent insights um, and uh, some good information for us at SciDevNet to think about how we cover this critical issue. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and um, enjoy the rest of your day.